I think many of the problems have already been identified. In fact, as the, both the speakers were going on, I was saying, there's not much left for me to say, but, uh, I'll, but I'll still take my 12 minutes. Uh, so what I, this uh, uh, key message of finding came out from the recent IPBES, which is the Intergovernmental Panel on Science on Biodiversity and Ecosystem Services, similar to the IPCC, but focusing on biodiversity and ecosystem services. And here you got one million of Earths. These are kind of pretty uh, problematic findings that we are finding here. We are on the, as supporting the, what Susan has already talked about, as a, a vector, that we are on a downward spiral here. And it's a vicious downward spiral, and in many cases, kind of driven by our own, what I would sort of say, predatorial instincts, which has, you know, from, from evolutionary to survival mode, and we are still in a survival mode. And I'm wondering whether we have actually reached a point where it's a tipping point, where we don't need to be in a survival mode. Uh, I wanted to throw in the third one, which is not part of the IPBAS, which kind of shocked me a little bit, because as somebody who's new to India, when I took up this position, and this was a WHO report in 2015, and it's saying 25% of children between the ages of 13 and 15, for me, kids of 13 and 15 should be having a, you know, should be having fun, should be playing around, uh, not thinking about uh, uh, problems, maybe not of the world, but at least their own particular problems, but have some form of mental illness. And these are only reported numbers. So the numbers must be much, much more staggering. And a lot of that is driven by the education system. It is driven by the education system for one reason, like recently they had a release of the, the so-called, the famous results of, I think it's at grade eight or 10. And on that particular day itself, 12 kids committed suicide because of the results that they received were not as high to the expectations. And many times, it's the parents who are primarily the main driver of this. Okay. Uh, that was not supposed to be blank, but <laughs> okay. So these are some of the things that we kind of seeing, uh, you have heard about global wicked problems. Uh, anxiety, depression, uh, WHO says this is one of the biggest uh, challenges that we're going to face in the 21st century. Uh, intolerance of violent extremism growing, that's uh, you read it in the papers on a daily basis. And the last one is the cost of education. You know, education now has become a, a really good lucrative business rather than being a, a social good in, it, in what is true nature it should be. So if we know what's wrong, why do we still do it? Is it just a human character, uh, characteristic? I look at where I am right now. I live in Delhi, and many of you must have heard of Delhi, especially it's, got its, uh, it's become quite famous recently. We are the most polluted city in the world. When I talk about really pollution, you live it. Uh, I took up this position when I was about 55, 56 years old, never had bronchitis asthma. In the first winter that I was there, I had a bronchitis asthma attacks. Uh, it's frightening. It, you, you have oxygen cut to your brains, you, 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 you have uh, seized out, you've collapsed. And I've never had this in my life. And this is a perfect daily thing that every, we face on a day-to-day -day basis, and yet we don't do anything. Why? I don't have any answers. So. I think the thing is we are confronted with competing choices. So in a sense, what I'm kind of alluding to is this cognitive dissonance that goes on in our brains on our daily life. You have to balance different things. And so I look at that as a collective uh, problem. I look at some of the more individual-based problems that we face on a daily-to-day -day basis. Your conditions of stress, you're looking at job security, you want to maintain your same lifestyles, or as we have come to worship material wealth. I don't know how many of you are on Facebook. I'm thinking of actually getting out of Facebook because all I see is they always say, who's the richest person in the world? It's like, who cares? But this is what it seems to be making news rather than saying, who's the kindest person in the world? How many of you have heard of Matthew Ricard? Apparently he's supposed to be the kindest person in the world. He's been, all right, too late. Fantastic person, but we never hear of him. Instead of that, we hear Jeff Bozos and, did, did I say Bozo or Bozo? <laughs> I hope I got his name. 
Decent. properly pronounced, <laughs> and the others. And it's like we got our matrix of success. Something is wrong with what we are doing. And I think many of the earlier presentations have already alluded to this particular point. So how do we break it? Right? Is education the solution? I don't think so. The way that we have right now, I don't think this is the solution. I live it. I had my seven-year-old son was diagnosed as silly, uh, dumb, a failure. This was at seven years old. It came from an education system, which is not, you know, we were in the Netherlands at that time. They just couldn't. But we diagnosed him as acute dyslexic. And he had a, sp a visual capacity at the 99%. He could do jigsaw puzzles backwards. He doesn't need to see them. So he's got different strengths. But the education system kind of already has stamped him as, as that. So we need a different system that looks at kids as each individual kid who has their strengths and their weaknesses and how do we address those. And it's competitive. When I, when I was in school, when I come back, I still remember this very vividly. My mom keeps telling me not to say this anymore in public lectures, but it's such a great uh, story that when I came back with a, I had hit an 85%. And she was so, and I was so excited. I was like 85% because I had hit 60% before. And the first thing she says is, so who, what was the highest? Uh, who, who scored the highest? And I said, uh, 99%. Well, hey, not good enough. So the pressure is there. Rather than sort of saying, hey, I've improved since that I'm learning, that was not. So, but, and it's inbuilt, I tr and I have to watch myself when I do it with my kids. So it's an automatic response, which goes in my brains, and immediately what I have to think, that's my system one thinking kicking in very quickly, and I have to really now have trained myself based on my own experience, my system two tries to not let the system one hijack and sort of say, it's okay, have they improved? Are they and rather than doing this competitive. And I really don't think the assessments that we have do any good. They don't measure learning. I don't know why we continue again. So it comes back to the CAT slide. Why do we continue doing this? I came across a 2014 letter to the Guardian, not to the Guardian, to the OECD, written by some of the top educationists around the world, 80 of them making a pleading for the OECD to stop doing PISA. It does more damage than good. It still continues. And now, in fact, they are even spreading it across more, uh, more, across more countries. So downward spiral. So this is the system that we have. It's very instrumentalist, which means it's about getting uh, output, getting, a, getting as high qualifications as you can, getting the best job you can, getting the most amount of income that you can get with nothing else in mind, right? And it's just going back. So a newer form of education is required, and I want to focus really on the emotional dimensions. We tend to slide emotional intelligence uh, as something that is not part of a formal education system. I think many of you say in the past, this was done within communities, maybe, I don't agree with that. What I think it would have done in the past is that you have families and they build this emotional intelligence just within yourself and maybe within the broader community, but you still look at anything outside as the other. So we, we, we are really good at doing the othering among groups that don't look like us or don't believe with our values. We tend to do the othering and stuff. And emotional intelligence is about looking at those particular issues. And so what I want to show you is an approach that we have done. So we got the rational and the emotional brain. And what, and what some of the latest research on neurosciences sort of say is they don't, they're, not, they're not separate. Your actions are not coming from the emotional side or it's not coming from the cognitive side. It is based on an interplay between the two. It's a matter of how well they are trained in the sense of finally dictating your final behavior. 
So Kahneman's work on system one, system two thinking is really uh, goes towards this. But the, the, the work that I really have enjoyed, I'm an economist by training, I'm a dumb economist by training, but the work that Robert Sapolsky has done in the work on behave talks about really about how these interrelationships work in terms of and making some sense of the system one and system two. So we need a new approach, one based on science and evidence. I, very, I found it very interesting that coming into education, it doesn't seem to be really informed by the latest science that's coming out on the science of learning. Cognitive science, the neurosciences, the psychology. It seems to be still driven by very old fashioned education based schools. When you talk about evidence, they don't seem to understand evidence. When you talk about science, they don't seem to understand science. Tell you a little bit, if Alberto gives me some time at the end, about an initiative that we are taking on at UNESCO. So this is the whole brain approach to education. We want to stimulate those networks, which is basically from the emotional to the cognitive. I will talk a little bit about what we call this, but this is what we have found from the neurosciences is in terms of activating this neural network automatically every time within your three pound structure that you carry between your ears. This is what we have developed at the Institute. It's called Libre. We have this uh, program where we focus on mindfulness. The mindfulness is about self-regulation and emotional regulation which means within yourself. I think Susan talked a little bit about that. Understanding yourself, understanding, finding peace within yourself. You can't find peace if you can't find peace within yourself. And most of us are so stressful and so, in most of the time, lots of anger, frustration. We need to try to calm down and get that stress free. It's not easy. The next one is empathy is about the other, trying to understand the other from their perspective, not from your perspective. What we find is when people talk to each other and we, we, when we try this listening exercise, most people don't listen. They're already trying to react to the other based on their perspective and not from the other perspective. Extremely difficult. The third one is compassion, is some doing something about it. So once you have the empathy, do something about it and not just sit there and be an idle standby. And a critical inquiry, we built it into it because we wanted to also instill the whole notion of inquiry. Question, question, question. Our education system really doesn't support that. Even when you talk about critical thinking, it sometimes doesn't get into the question approach. Teachers don't like this. So the minute I put that and talk about questioning, 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 they all look at me as, oh God, it's opening up a can of worms here. But this is what, and the, the, the modules that we have developed, let's say one on violence, starts off with this interesting uh, idea of critical inquiry. It's very interesting when we do in India, we, talked, we did this with 10-year-olds, uh, and the first thing is, who's your, who's your, who's your enemy? Pakistanis. What do you do? We kill them. 10-year-olds, they want to kill every Pakistani. Like, why? And then when we start buying, then they kind of, well, we've been told to. They say, so what do you happen if the, the Pakistani that you want to kill has children like you? They say, oh no, then we shouldn't kill parents. We just, just kill the soldiers. And we start, well, soldiers have their parents as well. So it continues and then they sort of say, hey, makes no sense what my original idea is. And within that, we build in the empathy training, compassion training. So we don't do it separate. We do it integrated within the concept. So we do climate change, get them all excited, frustrated, and then bring in this kind of perspectives. And we do it across cultures. We do it, we do it with students in the US, Norway, India, Bhutan, Sri Lanka, very, very different cultures, very different perspectives, and it's really interesting to see their different, the way they think about it. So, we call it firing Gandhi neurons, based from V.C. Ramachandran's work on mirror neurons, and the whole idea is to create this network because I was told to teach Gandhi values and I resisted on teaching Gandhi values. I said, let's try to create the neural networks that might have been going on in that old man's brain. Might hit it, might not. So, some takeaways. Trade-offs and cognitive dissonance is a grounded reality. This is what we have to live with, so accept it. It will always be there. 
The whole idea is to build that emotional intelligence to navigate that dissonance and to try to balance between the cognitive and the emotions. Because every action that you do, even a rational action, is defined by the emotional state. And the third, our education systems have to be transformed to develop emotional intelli intelligence using a whole brain approach. In a sense, don't break it up into just focusing on cognitive. Even when we talk about sustainable development, most of the time, I find it as a cognitive exercise. It's about, it's about the cognition, it's about the rationality, rather than trying to get the emotional part into it. And in fact, if you bring in, especially from the indigenous communities and listen to them, you get that emotion with nature. They don't look at it purely as a cognitive exercise. It's about emotions with the nature. And that is what we would need to do. Call to action. This is what we at UNESCO are trying to do. You know how long it takes to get a resolution at the, at the international level, but we want to mainstream SEL education. We, we were involved in an indirect way with the new education policy in India, and there is a paragraph within that whole policy on social emotional learning. So it's part of the new education policy, and in one of the states in India, the Andhra Pradesh government has already legislated an act where teachers have to be given 50 hours of social emotional learning training as part of their B ed courses. So if you go into B ed courses in that particular state, you will have to now do 50 hours of social emotional learning. Because you can't teach to the kids if you, can't, if you yourself are not at that level. So, flourishing. Thank you very much. <laughs>